Thank you. Well, good morning, church. That's pretty good. I'm not even asked for a second. We're just going to go with that. Well, we are going to begin a new series this morning. Um, it is officially summer. Um, yeah, did you feel all that summer kind of ooze down on you this morning? Woo! Almost too much. Um, I'm actually su starting a support group for global warming, like, because I think that's not a bad thing in Seattle. <laughs> all right. Well, on a more serious note, um, we're going to begin uh, a study uh, in the Psalms, and it's not going to be exhaustive. Um, we're not going to hit all of them, but uh, you're going to hear from different pastors, and we're going to share um, different psalms that are meaningful to us and hopefully will be a blessing to you. Some very familiar, some perhaps not as familiar, but uh, hopefully uh, will become precious to you. So let me ask God's blessing on our time, and then we will move into our study together. Let's pray. Lord, as always, it is uh, good to be here this morning. Uh, Father, it's a gift uh, to live this rhythm of gathering with your people at the beginning of the week and to seek your face, uh, to hear your voice, uh, to lift our hearts in uh, adoration. Uh, God, would you use this morning, uh, this time together, um, to build your people? Um, Lord, would you speak to us? Might we hear your voice? Uh, might we experience your joy this morning? Lord, uh, as we come here Everyone's in a different place, but Lord, you know the need. You know the need for conviction. You know the need for encouragement. You know the need for wisdom. You know the need for help. Father, whatever the need might be, would you minister in a very unique way to each individual, and Lord, might you minister in a powerful way. Father, we're so thankful that you are God, and that you're a God that loves to forgive sinners says in your word that as far as the east is from the west, so you remove our sins from us. And um, God, we will forever, forever, forever say thank you. Would you speak to us now? It's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. So, as I said, we are going to begin a new series and um, looking at some different psalms through the course of the summer. Um, the Old Testament, we've got how many books? 39. Um, <laughs> you guys are like, whoa, that's a lot of mental like horsepower. It's early. It's not early. Um, we have 39 Old Testament books. And it's interesting because the Bible structurally is, there's incredible symmetry um, the Old Testament, it's broken down into 17 uh, historical books and then 17 prophetic books. And then right in the middle, you have these five experiential. And it's interesting because those 17, they're also broken down into fives and twelves, right? You have five in the historical books that are pre the promised land, and then you have 12 that are during, in and out of the promised land. And then in the prophets as well, you have five major and then 12 minor. So you can kind of see there's this incredible beauty and symmetry of how uh, the word is organized. But right in the middle of the Old Testament, between the two 17s, you have five books that are experiential. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And these books, I would say, are, I call them experiential because they're really dealing with the human heart. They're dealing with individuals. The historical, really dealing with the nation of Israel. The prophetic saying, dealing with God's people as a nation, but these five books in between are dealing with um, heart issues, um, things that individuals would be wrestling uh, with. And I think they actually engage us in a deeper level emotionally, in particular the Psalms. Uh, in fact, I would say that the Psalms, uh, I would call them echoes of the soul. And maybe you have experienced, as you've read the words, that they're your words. 
They teach us how to pray. Um, let me give you an example. Psalm 6. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. For those that have been through horrific trial, maybe you lost a child, you lost a spouse, um, you went through a divorce, I mean, any number of things, and, and you remember that season, and you read this, and you're like, that's where I'm at. God gets me. I am the psalmist here. Or how about Psalm 42? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. And maybe some of you have experienced that. You're, you're not sure why there is this sorrow and this heaviness or this depression, and you're trying to preach to yourself, and you read these words, and you're like, yes, that's me. Or perhaps Psalm 35, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. And perhaps that has become a regular prayer that you pray on behalf of yourself and your family. Church, these are echoes of the soul. And they are so experiential in nature. And if I was to ask how many of you love the Psalms, I think probably every hand would go up. And it's interesting because the older I get, the more I find myself loving the Psalms. Well, first question we ought to answer here is, what specifically is a psalm? Well, a psalm, it comes from the verb zamar, which uh, is a verb in the Hebrew to sing, okay? And in its noun form, mizmor in the Hebrew, the word psalm actually translates melody. So a psalm is a melody to be sung. It's a poem to be sung, and perhaps to do so with stringed instrument. And it's interesting because, in fact, of the 150 psalms, 55 are actually uh, addressed to the chief musician, which meant they were meant to be sung. In fact, God has given us a book, essentially, of song lyrics. And some of you love your songs, and you love... And, and you're like, oh, yeah, I resonate with that. And, and you're connecting, and there's music, and there's something transcendent about music. It's a gift God gave us primarily to connect with him, to praise him. And uh, the Psalms are just that. Now, that said, we're not going to sing the Psalms this morning. I'm not going to do that for you. And that is my sole gift to you this morning. Um, but what we are going to do is we're going to study one in particular. And so as we begin this series on the Psalms, there's probably no better place to begin than in the first Psalm, Psalm 1. I believe that it happens to be the gateway into the book itself. I know that it's familiar, but perhaps some of you are not aware of really its importance. And um, hopefully you will gain something today just from taking some time to be in God's Word together. I believe it's the key to unlocking this entire book. And in fact, I would contend that this particular psalm is the key to really the Christian life. I would... Um, I would, in fact, argue that this psalm is, is really the gateway to the thing that we long for most, which is what? Which is joy. And so I've actually entitled this message, Gateway to Joy. So if you're taking notes, you can put that at the top. Now, one of the things that I love about this psalm is it's short. This is like a 10-minute sermon. No, no, no. That's not an amen moment. Um, it's not 10 minutes, but I love that it's so simple. I can do simple. I need simple. And the fact that it's simple and it's really defining for us the Christian life, it means, you know what? This thing is not so complicated. 
and, and I like that. So let's begin together and just we'll read through the entire thing to begin our time. Um, 73 of the Psalms uh, of the 150 are attributed to David. Uh, this one is not. We do not know the author, so he's not identified. But let me read. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers the wicked are not so, but they are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Antioch, this is God's gateway to joy. Any of you want to be happy this summer? Let's raise our hands. Let's just, I'm just curious. Is it all right? I didn't know if we had any really like masochistic types here. Just I think most hands uh, raised. Yeah, I think we all, we all want to experience happiness, experience joy this summer. This is how we battle for it. Um, here it is, and it, in just all of its really simplicity. Now, some of you may be going, Jay, how do you know this psalm is about joy. Well, because the very first word in it is blessed, blessed, blessed. Now, some of you may hear that word and think, ah, blessed. It's like, it's kind of a stodgy word. I remember my grandma, when I was sneezing, she'd be like, oh, bless your heart. Something going on in your life that was hard, oh, bless your heart. I don't know if this is, a, is my word. And let me just say, this is a great word. Blessed is not a stodgy word at all. In fact, the one used here, it, it's the word eh, esher. Um, it's used 26 times in the Psalms. There's, some other, there's another word actually used, but this, this one here in particular, it, it comes from the root word asher. It, esher comes from asher. Now, any of you being Bible students know that Asher is who in the Old Testament? He is the eighth son of Jacob. I think Carl gets a star. Come on, let's give it up for Carl. Whoa, yeah. We're going to do affirmation all morning. It's going to be great. You're going to love this, Carl. This is going to be good. Okay. Um, yeah, it comes from uh, the word uh, Asher. And in fact, this individual talked about in Genesis 30, 13, it says, and Leah said, and we know like the whole Leah, Rachel thing is sort of this Kardashian weird kind of <laughs> deal where Leah's like got the sad eyes and then Rachel's, you know, the loved, you know, she's loved and, and Leah's not, but she, I mean, it's just, there's a lot here. Uh, and it was interesting because my wife was actually doing a study on this section of scripture this week. And she's like, she didn't even know what it was about. And she's like, all right, kids, come around the table. And let me just read you the devotion this morning. And then all of a sudden she started talking about some mandrakes and like, and like swapping those for like some bedtime. with. And, and all of a sudden she's like, okay, children, <laughs> there's no devotion this morning. Go play in the backyard. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. It was completely awesome. I was totally engaged. Mandrakes, tell me more. <laughs> At any rate, I'm really off here, but Leah here uh, said, happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. Leah had a lot of hard things in life, but man, she had, she had a lot of sons, six, I think six sons uh, um, to Jacob. And she named one after this emotion of, of happiness. So Asher, Esher, this word, it means happiness. That's how we know what this psalm is about. 
It's not here a temporary kind of flimsy sort of happiness. It's not one contingent on circumstance. It's not like, oh, payday, I'm so happy. Like, your money's going to be gone before you sneeze because you got bills to pay. You got like a nation to feed in your house, or maybe that's just me. I don't know, but it's like gone, right? The food's gone. The juice is gone. If you live in our house, there's only juice for two people every morning. Everybody else drinks water for breakfast. So it's just how it goes. Um, temporary joy. Uh, some of you kids are like, snow day, that's the best. I'm so happy. No, you're not. Because it's July almost, and you're going to still be in school. It's a temporary joy. The joy in the Psalms is not like that. Um, in fact, we can see how this word is used in, a, in another psalm. In Psalm 32, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Brings another weight, gravity, to what it means to be blessed, to be happy. There is so much of life, folks, that we perhaps would love to do over. Um, chapters we would love to not have. Um, but we can't. We cannot do those things over. But we have a God who redeems and has said, hey, those sins, that chapter there's a different story being written. And those are like, they're done away with. They're erased. And all of a sudden, you're feeling the gravity of this joy now, right? Wow. I'm forgiven for real? Because no one else would forgive you. No one. But God says, oh, I will. It's unbelievable. It's this, we're talking about joy, which is soul happiness. I think it echoes in the words of the, the hymn writer Horatio Spafford in his incredible uh, hymn, It Is Well. He writes this, he says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't bear it. I don't carry the weight. I don't carry the shame. You start to feel some of that, that emotion. It's that joy. That's what the psalmist is talking about here. That heavy weight, it's gone. It's gone. It's fascinating to me, church, that Psalm 1 is about what? It's about happiness. Some of you have really bad theology and you think, man, the Christian life is just meant to torment me. Um, man, it's kind of rotten, but I think I get heaven in the end, so I'll go with it. And that's not actually the life promised to the believer. This life in the New Testament is called life that is what? Full? Abundant? And yet, this first, this gateway psalm is saying this is the way to happiness. This is the way to joy. Do people want to be happy in life? Everyone. And they're looking all over for it. Oh, I got to buy a new thing because that new thing is going to do what for me? It's going to make me happy. Does it? Maybe, right? I mean, it's just, it's Christmas morning all over again, right? For adults. We're just, I got to get that thing. And then it kind of fades. And we get hopped up on consumerism because we think it's going to fill something, it's going to fill that. 
I, I listened to a couple gals in my car this last week, and one of them was encouraging the other because she was leaving her husband. She was divorcing him. And this gal's like, man, it's going to be so much better. You're going to be so much happier. It's the, it's the motivating factor behind <laughs> so many decisions. Living for the flesh, indulging the flesh. I do so because I believe it's going to make me happy. Well, the psalm, this psalm confronts that lie. In fact, it confronts the very first lie ever spoken, right? Which is Satan in the garden telling Eve that God is holding out on her. That, that living in submission to creator God is really living in a straitjacket. It's so constraining. In fact, happiness, he suggests, is found, what? Living outside God's rule. Well, this psalm confronts that. Do we need this psalm? Church, do we need this psalm? Well, that's the right answer. Do we need this psalm? Yes! Why? Because this psalm confronts the lie at the beginning that continues to be told over and over and over again. Every day. You hear it. Oh, you'll find over here. You're going to be happy doing this. Joy over here. Joy over here. You look at the sinner and you envy. You have influencers all around suggesting Joy is found in other places. We need this psalm to roar. To hear God's voice tell us, hey, blessed if you walk my path. Happy. I want you happy. No, you don't, God. You want me to suffer. No. <laughs> I want you to experience the full joy of knowing your maker and being right with him. There's no better feeling, church. When you're a kid and, and for some reason you obeyed your dad, if you had a dad, maybe you didn't grow up with a dad, but, and you obeyed and then he came home and all of a sudden he's like, wow, you did the thing that I asked? Awesome. High five me. And you're feeling like, this is the best. Why don't I obey all the time? Because you believe happiness is actually found in disobedience. That's the lie. It was told at the beginning, and the enemy continues to spin the same stupid lie over and over and over again. Well, where is this pathway of joy found, according to God? And by the way, we serve a God who cannot lie. So here is the truth. Look at verses 1 and 2. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This is a tough sell, church. Because maybe some of you go, man, but oh, if I just, you know, satisfy myself, the desires of, of the flesh in this way, or I fill my life with these things, it's like I know. I just think it's going to be the thing. There is a lot being required of Psalm 1. It has to perform. And what I'm telling you is the truth. And what you have here is really joy, happiness is found in a lifestyle really of disassociating with one thing while associating with another. Some of you guys are hikers in here. 
It's summertime. We all got a hike in store this summer somewhere. Some of us big hike, some of us little hike. Me, I'm a mini hiker, but I hike nonetheless. And the point is, man, the image that we have here, there are two paths. And, and, and what the psalm is saying, like, this one over here, it's promising a waterfall, but at the top there's a cliff, and you will fall off. And you're like, no, 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 it'll be good. No. And, and God's saying, no, no, this one. This is the path. This one seems kind of hard. That one seems so easy. This is a tough sell for some of you. And maybe you guys have already, like, figured out the psalm. You're like, okay, Jay, I get it. Like, avoid sin, right, and read your Bible, and then I'll just be happy, happy, happy. All right, we're done early. Can I go home? No, you cannot, because I have a sermon to preach. This is all about me this morning. Actually, I believe this psalm uh, is far more helpful than a chippy summation um, of avoid sin and read your Bible. First question we ought to answer is what's the lifestyle we're to disassociate with? Well, it says here, don't walk in the counsel of wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. The late Eugene Peterson, I think he died last November, actually, October, November of last year. He wrote in the message, uh, he says it this way, you don't hang out in Sin Saloon. You don't slink along Dead End Alley. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. And so what the issue is here, the issue at stake is really, it's one of entertaining and then participating in sin to varying degrees. And you can see the progression. It's pretty obvious. Oh, I'm just kind of first walking. And then I know, oh, I, hmm. And then instead of like walking, I decided, no, I think I'm just going to stand here a while. Yeah, hanging out here, sinners, I think this is going to be good. I think I'm going to get comfortable. Yeah. You see the progression? Counsel of the wicked translates guilty ones. It's just a general term for, for sinner here. It's really this kind of kenosi idea of is this an offense. A one-time offense. It's just walking. But then you move on to the next layer of like standing with sinners. And the word sinner here is someone inclined to sin. And the emphasis is on not just a single um, act of rebellion, but really now you have more of a pattern that is demonstrating itself. And then if you continue in that pattern... You immerse yourself, all of a sudden what happens is you end up in the third category and you become really a mocker of God. A scoffer, which means mocker. Mocker of God. Mocker of holiness. Boaster, it can be translated, of what? Of sin. That's what happens. And we live on a planet where that's the case. I drove a couple... Friday night, Wu-Tang in town. Um, I don't even know what Wu-Tang sings, <laughs> but uh, I think they're like an early rap group or something. Um, if Jonathan was here, I would just like, and then he would be like some Wu-Tanging for all of us, but he's not. Um, but I drove this couple home, and all the time this gal was kind of uneasy in the back and is like, these two don't really go together. She was like 20-something, he was like she told me after he's 38, but he gets off first stop. They're sharing this ride. I thought they were they met at the concert, and uh, and then when we got to the place dropping them off, this guy was like, "Oh, come on, baby, just come in for five minutes." She's like, "No, no, I got to get up. I got a bike race tomorrow." Da da da. And she's like, "He's like, no, no, five minutes, five minutes." And I'm just thinking to myself, that is the lamest like line ever. <laughs> and I almost called him out. I had no idea of the context, but I almost called him out. Um, 
I did after he got out, and I just said, hey, I just want you to know that was really stupid what he just said. Do you realize, what, what does he mean? And she's like, oh, you saw it too. And she was so thankful. She was like, man, I was trying to leave this party and, or, or the concert, and I wanted to, you know, get home, and he, like, wanted to drive me. I said, no, I'm going to get an Uber. And then he said, oh, well, I'll come with you to make sure you get home safely. All of a sudden, guys become so concerned. He's so concerned for her safety. What a good guy. <laughs> and then she told me, you know what? He told me as we're coming over that he bet his friends 200 bucks that he could sleep with me. And I was just like, yes, yee, gross. I mean, she was just like, she, she's pretty grossed out. Um, but the point is, what's this guy doing with his buddies? Hey, check out what I'm going to go do. I'm boasting. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet 200 bucks. And he's so into his sin, he's even telling his, um, what do we call, his prey. Think, I'm thinking animals and eat, and he's thinking, he even tells his prey, this is what I'm going to do. See, that's, that's where sin leads eventually. And it leads to that place of God being just sort of vapor. Oh, he's fairy tale. He's a unicorn. He's all the gods. It's not a good trajectory to be on. And it's heartbreaking when you meet someone that once saw God as real and good and precious, and then they mock God. And I've met a number of young people like that. They mock righteousness. God is fairy tale. Well, the psalmist point here, church, um, is basically, man, avoid all of it. Even the entertaining of it. There's joy found in none of it, whether you're dabbling or well, whether you're immersed. Because the psalmist says, blessed is the individual who does not dabble, immerse, or just fully head first. There's no joy there. That's what the psalm is saying. That's not where you're going to find that soul happiness. And in fact, what's actually going to happen, that temporary buzz or whatever it is that you're, that fix, that small morsel that you're settling for, it comes with a cost. I think Hutch used to say this, sin will take you further than you want to go. Is that Hutch? Keep you longer than you want to stay. And will cost you more than you want to pay. He said it on good authority because you know what? The word of God, Psalm 39, 11, says it this way. When you discipline a man with rebuke for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Let that just saturate in. It's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible image. There's no lasting joy in that lifestyle. And maybe some of you are there this morning, and I'm just saying, man, you don't have to stay on the path. It's really, it's a simple matter of just repentance. To move back. And repentance is agreeing with God, this is wrong, and I confess it, and I will turn from it. And not just turn from it, but I will turn to you, God. And you don't have to put, like Carl said, you know, it's not money in the offering. You would feel better if you could do penance, but you cannot because that's how powerful the cross is. So that's the path to avoid. Um, the path that we're called to walk in, to associate with, is this, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. This is, this is pretty, pretty freaking cool. I think I can say that. 
yeah, that would be very tame if my people would just say that in my Uber. That would be wonderful. wonderful. But um, the psalmist uses the word delight, which means to find pleasure in. I just want us to pause here because this is so significant and it makes all the difference in pursuing after the Lord in this life. Let me ask you before, the other path. Was it duty for the individual to walk in the counsel of the wicked? Was it duty? Is it duty for you when you do that? No. Well, what about when you stand with the path, in the path of sinners? Is that duty? Well, I guess I'll participate in this sin. I don't want to, but it's my duty. I'll take one for the team. Was it duty? Or how about when you sit in the seat of mockery, when you fully immerse yourself in sin? Is that duty? No. Why'd you do it? Because you believed it'd be fun. You thought there was a measure of joy that you were going to receive. Well, then, when it comes to battling sin in our life, how do we do it? We do it through duty? Because if that's where you're at, you have already lost. The psalmist is proclaiming to us here, and catch this, we are fighting sin with joy. We are matching pleasure for pleasure. Battling sin with the promise of greater joy. In fact, it's not your duty to be in the law of the Lord. It's your delight. Folks, there's nothing better than hearing the Father's voice. Does that feel good? It feels great. And if you've been the prodigal, you know you feeling pretty good as a prodigal? Does that shame feel good? That duplicity? No. But when you know the, the Father's gaze is upon you and he's looking into light, man, that fills you. That is good. And it says here, delight in the law of the Lord. The, the word law kind of maybe, oh, law, that's not good. The word, it, it translated Torah. Um, and actually, Torah is basically uh, translate instructions of God. That's what it means. Oh, instructions? Instructions sounds way better than law. Instructions, are there commands? Yes, but there's also descriptions and there's explanations. This is how life works. This is how it goes. These are the reasons. And what's so cool is the psalmist saying, man, delight in the Torah of God. Delight in the instruction of God. Where's the Torah in Scripture? First five books of the Bible. That's the Torah. And the psalmist's way saying, no, no, delight in the Torah. Do you realize that the book of Psalms is divided into five books? I think there's a connection there. They're so cool. The psalm is saying delight in the song, delight in the instructions that are here. They're like song lyrics. There's poetry. They're prayers. And they are yours. Let them become yours. Delight in that. Meditate. Murmur. Ponder. Chew. Dwell. What's so cool about the book of Psalms? What kind of book is it? It's an experiential book. So delight in the experiential of seeking after your God. It's dynamic. It's not rule following. It's relationship of a father that actually knows not just a lot. He knows everything perfectly. And has good instruction on all of it. Not to crush your spirit, but to 
actually liberate your spirit. Church, do you believe, this is the real question now, we're not in church, we're just sitting, having, we're having some bubble tea, I don't know why I chose that, uh, <laughs> that's what we're doing, we're having some bubble tea, and, and I just ask you, like, do you believe, sip, sip, uh, that living under the rule of God will bring you happiness? We're not in church, right? Jesus, no, we're at bubble tea, okay? You can't say that. Do you believe that happiness is found lived under the rule of God? See, this is where the battle is, church. It's, it's an issue of belief, which is why this psalm, it has to roar. Blessed, blessed. God's saying happy. It's for your happiness. It's found here. I don't think so because it sounds like a lot of self-denial. And I think if I just indulge it, it'll be a lot better. And God's saying, no, it won't. It's a temporary fix. It's not. And it's not the goodness. There's no richness. And really what we're talking about here is surrender. Where is joy? It's in that posture. God, you know I'm not perfect. Oh, how God knows you're not perfect. Which is why he went to the cross. But surrender is that posture of God, my intent, my heart is to do what you would have me do. I want to do it your way. It's a very different posture than the other pathway, which is really the posture of defiance. I'm going to define sex and money and, and power and, and everything apart from you because I know best. That's not, that's not the way to hike. And we're given two pictures here at the end for us visual learners. It says verses 3 and 4, it says, here's, here's the pictures of these two paths. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Such a good word. The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. Here's the contrast. You want to live under the rule of God in this life? I do. I don't always, but I want to. Well, that's the desire of a, of a, of a believer. That's a good thing that that's in there. And sometimes there's tension. That's good. When you're convicted over sin, that's a really good thing. Celebrate it. Not the fact that you just did something, but celebrate the fact that you were convicted. Yes! Because that means God's still speaking to you. The image here, you live the life yielded to God's authority. You're going to be a tree planted. You want to go your own road and basically live an ever-increasing lifestyle of immersion in sin? You are chaff. What do you prefer? It's really your call. Well, I want to be a tree, but I behave like chaff. Well, stop. Repent. Well, I don't know, Jay. I don't know how to begin to, like, experience the delight in God. You know what? Simple. We did Psalm 1 this morning. Guess what? Tomorrow, Psalm 2. And begin to chew on it and let God's voice be present, influencing. And then Tuesday, Psalm 3. And if you get really ambitious, Tuesday evening, Psalm 4. I think I can do that. Yeah, you can. I can. We can. I don't want to be shaft. I don't want to live in rebellion to, to my God. Shaft is like the husk of, of the corn or the grain. It's like that thin, like, film around it. Separated on the threshing floor. When you winnow wheat, you know, it's, you're trying to crack that and get rid of it. And so you're throwing it up, you know. And the wind, right, 
as the husk separates from the kernel, what happens? The shaft is just blown away. What's it good for? Nothing. Do you think about it? No, you don't. It's just forgotten. Well, that's like the wicked. Oh, man, that person was the best partier ever. God rest their soul. Man, they could light it up like Noah. They were so amazing. I want to follow him. I want to emulate that. Man, we can never forget how good they were able to indulge their flesh. Right? We should memorialize it. Think about it. At least once a week. We can never forget. No, you will be forgotten. Because nobody cares. This season of ministry, being an Uber driver, it's three years and I've seen the same type of thing. It's like over and over and over and over. And what people don't realize is they all say the same thing. You drive the young bucks and they're like, oh man, we're just, we're young. We got to live our 20s. We got to live and we got to just party and, you know, and, and, you know, just suck the marrow out of the city and we're going to, and then you meet your late 20s and they're saying the same thing. And then the 30s, they're saying the same thing. Oh, we're just, we got to be young and we're just, and guess what? It never ends. I drove three 40-something-year-old ladies Friday night, and I'm telling you what, they were, they were behaving like they were 19. They were lit up. They get in the car, they're like, Uber driver, you got a pot pen? And I'm just like, I'm fresh out, you know. Uh, what about something to drink? You got some vodka? I'm like, nope. And they're like, well, what about some water? I'm like, not for you, because <laughs> I wasn't going to share. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it doesn't stop. Earlier in the week, I drove a mom and her daughter, a 55-year-old gal and her adult daughter, out. They went out drinking. And the daughter was drunk, so the mom was tired and taking care of her. It was like, this cycle never ends. And it's a lie. Oh, we just got to do it now and then we'll, then we'll change. It's so forgettable. And to get that buzz, that happiness fix thing, you got to continue to do this thing over and over, every weekend, every weekend, and some during the week. And the ultimate end, we see in the end, verse 5 and 6, hey, therefore the wicked... They'll not, they'll not stand in the judgment, talking about the Bema seat, the, the reward seat for believers here, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They're not going to be there at the end, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know, we're given promises for the for the believer that says, I'm trying to do things God's way. I'm trying to be in that yielded posture. And you have a wonderful image of this healthy tree by streams of water, drinking in God's voice. Oh, how we, we want to hear God's voice. And it says of this individual who's living in this yielded posture, seeking to hear from God, these are the song lyrics, not all that other stuff that's just... It says here, you know what? There'll be fruit in its season. An individual in that posture, guess what? Their life is going to produce fruit. They're going to be productive. They're going to be useful for real ministry. If you're not, if you're not yielded to God, you have no ministry. Hey, I want to tell you about God. He's so good. I don't really follow him, but man, he's good. No power there. So additionally about this individual walking this path, yielded to the highest authority. It says the leaf does not wither. So regardless of what comes in life, right? And guess what? Life is going to have stuff. Amen? Amen? Jesus says in this world you'll have what? A carnival? No. Tribulation. But regardless, this individual, there's a resilience here. And much of that comes from the right perspective 
that comes from then delighting in God's word. Oh, suffering? I believe this. This isn't my home. Pain, illness? Oh, God said this is a tent. It's temporary. But there's something better. I believe that. Yeah, circumstances can't steal that joy. A life in the word is a life resilient to the most desperate hours of life, church. And I'll end with this example in 1871. Horatio Spafford, we just read some of his lyrics earlier. His only son died. 1871. Shortly then, um, there was a great fire in Chicago, and it ruined him financially. Then in 1873, he sent his family ahead to Europe while he stayed back for business. And while he sent his family, his wife and four daughters ahead, the ship collided with another ship, and it went down. And he lost his four daughters in an instant. And he became aware of this because his wife sent a telegram back with two words that just said, saved alone. Shortly after that, he traveled, Horatio traveled to meet his just broken, devastated wife. And on that travel, slow travel days by ship, when he got to that place where his daughters lost their lives, he penned the words, right? Of this song. It is well. And he wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. And he was experiencing sorrow after sorrow after sorrow after sorrow. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, I'm living yielded to you, God, but you've taught me to say, it's well, it's well with my soul. I'm connected to you, God. And so I can say this, and I can experience your ministry. But the song doesn't end there. He pens and, it, and he writes, O Lord, haste the day when faith shall be sight. Haste the day. I'm longing for reunion. I long for you and I long for my beloved family. Haste the day when faith shall be sight. The, crowd, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. This is what's true. Even so. It's well with my soul. Church, there is so much goodness. There is so much joy in a life yielded to the rule of God. And it doesn't mean avoiding all of life. It means engaging in all of life in the way that he says this is what's best. In all areas. But the issue is belief. Do I believe this? In the moment of temptation, do I believe this to be true? It's, it's a battle for belief, church. If you stay convinced that Psalm 1 is telling you the truth, then joy will be present in your life until your final breath. Period. Father, thank you for time together. Thank you that you tell us the truth. Lord, some of us don't believe this. Some of us have moments of not believing it. But would you resound in our hearts, almost as if you were yelling at us, blessed, happy, I want you happy, and this is the way. Oh, church, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
and happy is the man or the woman who takes refuge in him. Lord, I pray for the joy of your people today, and I pray for their joy this week, and I pray, God, if they're in a space where they are not experiencing your joy, and they're, they're, they're just waffling on this issue of obedience and not sure if it's, if it's really going to pay the dividends of, of, of joy, God, I pray that you, would, um, that you would give them the capacity to repent, because we know repentance is a gift. And Lord, that in our obedience, would you allow us to experience a commensurate amount of your joy? God, would you remind us that we walk not as condemned, but as forgiven, not as victims, but as more than conquerors because of what you have done on our behalf that will resound forever. God, it's a delight to gather with your people. Would you go with us and might we experience your presence this week? And Lord, might we hear your voice as we spend time in your word. It's in your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Enjoy today.